people have to understand that Elder Rufus, Pastor Rufus, has been my greatest rah-rah cheerleader, whatever you want to call it. Multiple times he has stated, you cannot tell me nothing about Pastor Dow. I'm praising nigga too much. But why is he gonna think you soft? Nobody has ever, at least with their lips, has ever supported me with their lips like Pastor or Elder Rufus has over the years. He is the one that continues to keep even privately even telling Pastor Mir and him at the feast, the last feast we was, you cannot tell me nothing about Pastor Dow. You know the reason why? Because when they didn't have a place to go, Pastor Dow and the ministry of Straightway provided it for him and the saints. When they had nowhere to go, we provided it for them. And that's just a statement of fact. We gave them a, some land and a place to go. So, and my statement at that time was, you don't have to ever worry about being put out on the street by the heathen again because somebody wants to raise the rent for you. Now, all these people out there that are so-called for all these other people, I, I, I don't know how much more just, how much more honest, and how much more true than you can actually be than, than what we are right here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> this is Showtime at the Apollo or, 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 <laughs> or Comedy Central or something, man. <laughs> because this is funny. Hey, I want y'all to see something that's, that... What do you gain from putting this man's business all out in the street, knowing that his wife and kids could hear that? And what's sad is the people in the chat are always saying, bless you, Shep. You know, just sitting there with their brains turned off out of order, watching this man drink his way to eternal damnation. Again, I will keep emphasizing that Dow is the face of polygyny, which is sin. I'm not here to beat up on the man. I just want to see him repent. But I know that if any of you who support polygyny build communities like Dow, not only are you going to sin through polygyny, but you're also going to fall into unrepentant adultery. Because right now you guys are just talking. You have no idea what it is like to actually build communities like Dow has. And that's why I say he is the face of polygyny. And I don't want to come off as defending Dow and his actions. But the, the truth in the matter is you guys have just never been in a situation where you have all of these women coming on the communities and your ego is being stroked like that. I mean, after all, he's a man and so are you. Okay. That's, that's why the scriptures say avoid all appearances of evil. Okay. God will not put more on us than we could bear. There's, there's a certain measure of faith that each man has, but we all know that women has always been the weakness and downfall of men. Now, Dow talks about being just and honest. Look, dude, you did everything in your power to humiliate Rufus. You talking about how he's lazy and was homeless until you showed him mercy, only to treat your brother worse than the heathen Gentiles. I heard that he does these sport talk radio shows four or five times a week three, four hours of pop sometime up in the wee hours of the night, speaking about secular talk, I mean, basketball for hours on end. My question is, what is a pastor in the ministry doing on a sports radio broadcast talking about basketball four or five times a week, hours on end? Him talking about sports five times per week it's no different than you boasting about how many communities you built. In fact, what you do is worse because your homesteads are a major asset in your capacity to perpetuate your adulterous lifestyle. Again, that confirms when I called him lazy, he's lazy. Now, let me let me say this, y'all. I cannot say that everything that Elder Rufus, Pastor Rufus has ever done has all been wrong. He hasn't. He has done much great things as far as making ministry trips, doing counseling, um, being there for people uh, when they in need of different things. He's done that. But when it comes to putting his hand to the plow, he has not done that. He has not done that at all in any way, shape, fashion, or form or any place. He tried to flip the script, and he continues to keep doing this by trying to say that I am saying that the brother, the brother, 
um, that Pastor Donald is talking about us. We can't do nothing. We, no, no, no. Don't get it wrong. I said, you can't do nothing. That's how I've always presented. I said, you as a leader, you cannot lead by example. I told that to his face. He can't do it. I said it in the meeting in front of all the elders and the pastors. I even used the analogy of saying, I, Pastor Rupert has four wives, four wives and two daughters down there. I said, you take your family and I'll take my family. And I can literally take my family, my me, myself and my issues and my family, and I can build a house from the ground up just using them. Now, this is probably one of Dow's greatest downfalls in the building of so many communities while keeping the title pastor. I don't think he really understands the sobriety, the humility of a shepherd, dedication and thorough inspection of the Holy Scriptures. The late man of God, Stephen Darby, he once said that a pastor should fast more often than his sheep. And Stephen Darby was a hardworking man as well. He built houses. He built Graceland Retreat. And he even left an inheritance for his family. But his doctrine did not navigate from truth in the scriptures. He was a real man of Yah. God bless his soul. But in John chapter 5, verse 39, Christ said, Search these scriptures if you think you have eternal life. So you're sadly mistaken if you think you can build your way into the kingdom. Just living in adultery, causing many who follow you to land in eternal hell. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, Christ said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's why in Matthew 19:21, he said to the rich young ruler, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You see, you can't serve God and mammon. Christ said, woe to you who are rich in Luke 6, 24. And thou... You are rich. I don't care what you say. You are rich. You claim that if you are a king, you are a poor king or whatever you said. But you have far more than even the most affluent Edomites who live in the fatness of the land. Hypocrite. I promise you he cannot do that. No, make this statement. You know why? Because he has wasted time. The man does not want to work. You've heard the saints there in Georgia say it. He does have the gift of gab. He will run his mouth for hours on end without end and wear you out. He even told Elder Mitchell and some of the other brothers that all the brothers in Georgia is with him because he kept wearing them out through meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings. So when the brothers finally came up the straight way to hear the other side and then give their own testimony, it was cut and dry. Okay, look, just look at Daniel Muir the bottom right corner. This brother is lost. He has no idea what he is subscribing to, or maybe he does. You know, pro athletes are accustomed to witnessing a lot of whoredom. They're accustomed to witnessing a lot of adultery. It is incredibly difficult for a pro athlete to make a sincere, thorough transition into becoming a man of the scriptures. I have had to put in hours of studying and quiet a long time with no hype men, not all this noise around me, but silence and studying the scriptures. But a lot of pro athletes are looking for something to quench that adrenaline that they had when they once played, because it really is true. The saying that says athletes die twice, OK, because their career is like a death to them. Years ago, I did a video on how the devil came to collect Kobe, and I believe his death allegedly was suicide. I believe it was a ritual. I believe it was a blood sacrifice, and they planned for his plane to crash, and that's the way he wanted to go out, okay, allegedly. Also, I remember George Foreman, former heavyweight champion of the world, legend George Foreman, I remember he took 10 years off from boxing to preach, but then he returned after 10 years because heavyweight champion is what he became. Okay, that's what people know him as. 
that is his identity. Okay, doesn't mean he can't repent and be saved, but they don't have the patience to search the scriptures. Okay, so when a false prophet like Dow comes to town, I mean, it's over because he does so much to appeal to their flesh. And that's the world that they spent so much of their lives living in. He said when he first showed up in straightway, we were poor as shit. Um, we were still able to have a roof over our head. Clothes on our back and shoes on our feet. But I remember when you showed up the straightway, you showed up in a 1996 Lincoln, an old green Lincoln with every single thing you had in your life in that trunk. You showed up and you had zero money. You had nowhere to go. You were literally running around like a nomad. I mean, when you make these statements, you don't think that you're going to be called on the stuff that you, and mind you, you didn't buy nothing in straightway. Everything you ever acquired in straightway has been given to you. Starting when you come in here to this man right here. Have you forgot that I set you up and your family gave you a roof over your head? Gave you a place to stay? Have you forgotten that? Now, this is always a problem with polygyny in a fallen state. The Most High in the Old Testament, he instantly killed dudes like Dow. In Numbers chapter 16, Korah rose up against Aaron and Moses pretty much accusing them of being dictators over the holy congregation of Israel. You may say, well, what does this have to do with polygyny? Well, I'm getting to it. I believe power and women are two dynamics that cause Korah and his household to defy Moses even after the Most High used Moses to bring all the plagues upon Egypt. Uh, he parted the Red Sea. He was praying, fasting, and interceding for the nation so that God didn't destroy them. So I believe it was more of a power move of jealousy, envy on the part of Korah. In addition to that, some things require an act of God. At one point, Moses was even afraid that the children of Israel would stone him to death because they didn't have enough meat and they started complaining. And this is why I call Dow the face of polygyny, because he actually thinks he is Moses. Again, he's one of these guys who's trying to reinvent the Old Testament. But in this fallen state, you got a bunch of men trying to play God. It is only by the grace of God that he don't open the ground and drop them into hell like he did Korah. Because that was what was really taking place under the law of Moses. That's the price that they paid living in fear, being in the presence of the Most High God, that was the price that they actually paid for polygyny. You know, but not a lot of these guys are talking about this. Again, polygyny is a packaged deal. In Genesis 38, God killed Onan for going into Tamar, his brother's wife, his brother who was deceased, okay, he killed him for going into her and refusing to raise an heir for his deceased brother. Because that was the law at the time. That was the tradition to keep the bloodlines pure. Abraham married his half-sister Sarah because during that time, it was a privilege to marry within the bloodlines. Okay? It was a penalty. For a man to have to travel to another man's house, pay him a dowry, and marry one of his daughters, risking the peril of her having a higher concentration of fallen angel blood. That was the whole point of the Law of Moses, which is the foundation of polygyny. That was the whole point to offset the contagion of fallen angel blood. That's why the Most High commanded Israel not to integrate with the foreign women. In Genesis chapter 3, Eve sinned against her body with the serpent, and she was cursed with the monthly impurity that perpetually affects all women to this day. You see what I'm saying? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 18 says, He who commits fornication sins against his own body. So Eve sinned against her own body with the serpent. That's why she was cursed in that area. She used to sin by God. Okay. Also, 
for a fallen angel to enter a woman is perversion. It's just as bad, if not worse, than a man entering another man. And throughout this series on polygyny, we will take a deeper dive into some of the plagues that stem from demon DNA. Have you forgotten? You tell everybody you had these six-figure jobs. If you have a six-figure job, how the hell that all you have to your name is a Lincoln, an old Lincoln Continental with every single thing you have in your trunk, in the back of that trunk? It makes no sense. And then you said, I mean, but you claim we're poor shit. But you sure didn't mind taking our money. You sure didn't mind using our money when it would benefit you. I mean, somebody, listen, I'm not worried about the, the illiterate, the spiritually illiterate, the spiritual retarded people that cannot grasp this stuff. I'm not at all. But it's got to be sooner or later, somebody's got to see that when you hear his voice, there's some envy in there. There's some jealousy in there. There's some rage in there. Over what, though? I mean, even in the world, there's this old saying, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. I mean, damn. And, and think about this. I'm a man that never, ever boasts about it. He said that when the NFL people and all these other people came here, uh, I had a rah-rah crew. None of them have ever been able to outcheer you. So I said this earlier, I'll say it again. Al is the face of polygyny in this modern fallen state. Okay, and that's not a good thing because polygyny is sinful. Okay, no Israelite has built communities across state lines and practicing uh, having multiple wives. Now you may say, well, he's living in adultery. That's my whole point. That's what polygyny leads to in this modern fallen state, okay? And we can see that his fruit is corrupt. It's rotten, okay? Everything he boasts about is in the flesh because polygyny was always about the flesh, even under the law of Moses. However, the law of Moses was very unforgiving to the works of the flesh because they had to kill the human host to cast the demon out. Okay. So when someone committed adultery, that was a demon that entered them and corrupted their bloodline. You see what I'm saying? The children of Israel were under a lease agreement. The covenants and curses from the most high in Deuteronomy chapter 28, they were under a lease agreement because the earth the land has a lease agreement. That's a spiritual covenant with the Most High. That's also why to this day, the Gentiles have a lease agreement over the earth with the Most High. Okay, I don't have time to get into that. But under Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy chapter 17, 17, the Israelites, they were evicted from their land. It took 2,000 years for the entire process to complete, okay? The eviction included reformation of 95% of the laws under Moses. But God had to give Israel two things. Number one, he had to give them an eviction notice according to Deuteronomy 17, 17, Deuteronomy 28, and also, he mentioned it in uh, the book of Second Kings somewhere during the reign of Josiah, where God said he's going to wipe Israel like one who wipes a dish clean. Okay, that was another eviction notice. In, in, in Deuteronomy 17, 17, again, he said, a king shall not multiply wives, but God also needed to give them a flesh and blood example of why he said that. Because if we never read about David and Solomon's downfall from women, we would not have clarity about Deuteronomy 17, 17. You see what I'm saying? God doesn't work in time. That's the whole point of something called a prophecy. Okay, so when he was saying a king shall not multiply wives for himself, don't take that in a vacuum, say, well, he's just speaking to a king. No, the king sets the example for all the people in the land the same way that a bishop sets the example for all the men in the church. So, moreover, when Apostle Paul talks about the sanctification of husband and wife, singular, 
we have a reference for the iniquity in polygyny. Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, uh, Jacob, Rachel, and Leah, David and Abigail, David and Bathsheba, Absalom was with David's wives, Solomon's wives were wicked, etc. Okay, these are all examples of how polygyny went south. This is why there is no sanctification for concubines and multiple wives in the New Testament. Sanctification is a license from God to have sex. Furthermore, the Old Testament distinguishes between a harlot and a concubine. The New Testament does not. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 15 and 16 says, in a nutshell, a man joined to a harlot is one flesh. Okay. What about concubines? They're the same thing as a harlot in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, there were sin offerings that were made. There were turtle doves, weekly consecrations for women, wave offerings, peace offerings to account for men being able to have concubines. Because all of those sin offerings, the bloodshed of animals, covered that iniquity. You see what I'm saying? Or what is considered iniquity today wasn't then. The contagion of sin hadn't gotten to the degree that it is today where you can't keep that law anymore. You can't keep track of who, what concubine belongs to which household, to which man. You see what I'm saying? In the New Testament, Paul talks about dual benevolence between a husband and a wife. Again, singular. Okay, let's read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to go through 1 through 9 first, then we're going to cover 10 through 6, verses 10 through 16. Okay, it says in chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, starting off at verse 1. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay, let's start there. If he has all these concubines and all these wives, why would Paul say that? Again, Paul being an apostle, introducing new revelation, okay? He's not regurgitating the law of Moses. Forget about the law of Moses at this point. This is why Paul wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. God anointed him as an apostle. This is why they wanted to kill Paul. Okay? He's introducing new revelation, saying it's not good for a man to touch a woman. If we're still living under the Old Testament law, this would be foolish for him to say that because you see all these women in the church being concubines assigned to all these different men. You see what I'm saying? Then uh, later on, I don't have the scripture in front of me, but Paul talks about how the women in the church are growing impatient because they don't marry. Well, if men are marrying multiple women in the church, I don't think that that would be an issue. Nevertheless, I'm not going to go off track on that right now. I'm going to stay right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So verse 2, he says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man, singular, have his own wife, singular, and let each woman, singular, have her own husband, singular. Verse 3, now he's getting to talking about sex. Let the husband render to his wife, singular, the affection to her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. Okay. He didn't say, let the husband make sure that he uh, uh, makes time for each of his wives, giving due benevolence to each one of his wives if he chooses to go that route. If he was talking about multiple wives, he would have explained it like that, man. Okay. So, verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Okay. Didn't say the husband has multiple wives 
that are entitled to his body. No, again, this is all singular, one-on-one, -on -one, husband and wife. Each, each benevolence due to the husband, benevolence is due to the wife, okay? Uh, uh, verse 5, do not deprive one, an one another, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. In the, in the Old Testament, Levitical priests were fasting on behalf of the children of Israel. But in the New Testament, the scriptures say, now you can approach the throne of grace boldly, okay, through fasting and prayer. But then Paul said, then you come together so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. How does a man need to have self-control if he has multiple wives? So you got to ask these guys these questions. Okay, we know under the Old Testament there was some form of self-control because if he didn't have self-control under the Old Testament, it could cost him his life. Now, in verse 6, Paul is saying, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as myself. Now he's going to another level. He's going to, okay, it's okay for you to have one wife, but if you really want to go deeper spiritually with the Most High, you'd be like Paul. That's why I also said in other videos, it is likely that the apostles were not married men. At least most of them were not married men. They were constantly spending time in prison. Their life was constantly in, in, in danger because, again, they were introducing new revelation. That anointing that was on them attracted a huge bullseye on their back from the kingdom of darkness, okay, because the whole world lie in wickedness, okay? You're talking about spiritual wickedness at high places. You see what I'm saying? Paul said, for I wish that all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God. See, that's why I was talking about with the professional athletes. Okay, it's not hating. See, these, these people who are idolaters and they so fleshly and carnal, when you say stuff like that, they say, well, you just hating. No, do your due diligence and study in the scriptures and listen to what he's saying out of his mouth. He's just repeating what Dow says, all right? His gift expired already. Again, that doesn't mean that Daniel Muir, Kabir, also Robert Mathis, that doesn't mean that they can't be saved. But when you got a false prophet like Dow who just get up here and just appoint three different ministers, uh, former football players, it looks bad, okay? Especially when his doctrine is false. So Paul said, but, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and one in another in that. Verse 8, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But verse 9, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Okay, and that's addressing Geno Jennings, who really doesn't go deep into all the different variables of what can happen with divorce and remarriage. But I'll have to tackle that in a whole nother video. So going down to verse 10 is when Paul begins to talk about sanctification. Okay, again, as I promised, we're putting the Old Testament law side by side with New Testament law. This is new revelation. Paul is not regurgitating what the law of Moses was. Continuing at verse 10, he says, Now to the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried and be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. This applies to husband and wife. Paul, instead of just repeating what he was saying about the wife, it just applies to the husband as well. 
they shouldn't just be divorcing for any other reason. But if they choose to, really the husband, because he's the provider, he shouldn't just for any reason just be divorcing his wife. That's really what Paul is saying. He should not, because then he puts her in a compromising situation where she can steer away from the, fl the faith. Okay, especially if that man was a believer, she can steer away from the faith by him abandoning her. That burden might be too much for her. Okay, so the husband, Paul is saying, since he's the stronger vessel, because he, he, Paul also said the woman is the weaker vessel, the husband should not have any reason to divorce his wife. Okay, God in his infinite wisdom, I believe, also knew for the foundation of the world that the woman will be filing for divorce way more than the man does. So that's why God, through the apostle Paul, gave this amendment here. Okay, so if the woman, for whatever reason, just want to be by herself, she doesn't want to be with that man, then let her be by herself. She's not to remarry. And that's what he's saying in verse 10. Now, going down to verse 11, he says, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Verse 12, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, says, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman, verse 13, who has a husband who does not believe. See, everything is mano y mano. When he ever give, whenever he gives revelation about the husband, he's coming back giving revelation about the wife. There's no plural here. I don't know where these heretics are getting this polygyny from. Polygyny is not in the New Testament. So he says, if she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Well, what is all of this for? Because of the fallen angel DNA, the demon DNA that plagued the human race. Okay. But in the beginning, well, under the law of Moses, God was trying to consecrate the children of Israel from all of this but they disobeyed. So in verse 14, Paul says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife, not wives. We're talking about legal sex here. Okay. Which is a part of the whole program for salvation, because if you have having sex illegally, that can cost you your soul. So this is very important stuff here. If he, if he was t including concubines and multiple wives in this, he would have said it. For the unbelieving husband, verse 14, is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Okay, we know he's not talking about holy as far as keeping the commandments not sinning because they're children, okay? They are born into sin. Although they're, although they're innocent children, they're born into sin. And the parents, he's saying, are unbelievers. So most likely, they're not teaching them the commandments. When you have a married couple, husband and wife, having children, they did it the right way. That's all that's saying. Verse 15, but if the unbeliever departs, let him Depart. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Meaning, if you're the one who didn't file for divorce, you can't control what another person does. See, Gino doesn't talk about this. He's a false prophet. He does not emphasize this part right here. You're not the one who filed for divorce. You can go on and remarry. Okay, it is not sin. He, if Paul is saying a person is not in bondage. That person who chose to divorce him or her does not control that person's fate and rather or not they are sanctified. So Paul is clearing all of this stuff up. And again, no concubines are mentioned. No multiple wives are mentioned here. 
Finally, in verse 16, for how do you know, O wife, pretty much saying what I just said, how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? So five times, husband and wife, throughout this whole passage, at least five times, husband and wife is referred to by Paul as singular. Okay, if he, again, an apostle, introducing new revelation, anointed by God, if he was condoning men to have multiple wives, he would have went through the sanctification of wives, plural, and concubines, plural. I know I just went through a lot there, and I got, I got more ground to cover. In the next video, I'm going to go back to the Old Testament and go a little bit more in detail talking about the law of jealousy. But in closing, Pastor Dow is the face of polygyny. Okay, I want you to look at his fate and what is going on with him right now is climax of polygyny. Any man who goes to that high level because he's at a high level practicing polygyny, okay, which is really a high level of temptation. You're giving Satan more opportunities to tempt you to fall into adultery. Really, that's all that is. Okay, but I don't have time to go further. Guys, don't let your flesh write checks. Your soul cannot cash in the afterlife. The devil does not get screwed on the deals he makes with men. Okay, he's incredibly skilled at destroying men. He's a supernatural assassin. All right, Lord, help us all.